Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Emily Knox, and I am an associate professor at the School of Information Sciences. It says that behind me, I'm, but my uh, background is my slide, so it's hard to see. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, banned books and a little bit about critical race theory. Um, and as I'm going through my slides, you're welcome to ask any questions you might have. Um, this is really quite informal. Um, I'm just going to present some of the information that I have, especially in my book called uh, Book Banning in 21st Century America, which came out in 2015 and is now out in paperback. Um, and a little bit that's in my forthcoming book, which is Foundations of Intellectual Freedom. I have pictures of those books at the end, so you can see more information there. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, really, what I'll be talking about today is why do people ban books? So I've always been interested in banned books. Um, my mom was a high school librarian and um, we always observed Banned Books Week, probably starting with the first one in 1982. Banned Books Week was started by Judith Krug, who was the director of the Office for Intellectual Freedom at American Library Association. So we always did stuff for banned books. My mom would bring home the lists and uh, sh we would, you know, I would notice that a lot of the books that I liked, especially Are You There, God is Me, Margaret, um, was on the list. And I would be, you know, just wondering why were people trying to ban books? Um, so this is actually one of my favorite uh, banned books uh, posters. I have a couple of them in here. Uh, this is the robot uh, who unplugs themselves from the machine. Um, so one thing we, we talk about a lot as librarians is intellectual freedom. It's not a term that a lot of people use, but um, it is really what Banned Books Week is about. Uh, banned uh, intellectual freedom is uh, <clears throat> the right of every individual to both seek and receive information from all points of view without restriction. Um, it provides free access to all expressions of ideas through which any and all sides of a question, cause, or movement may be explored. Um, censorship is really its opposite. So this is the suppression of ideas and information that certain persons, individuals, groups, or government officials find um, objectionable or dangerous. These are um, definitions from the American Library Association, which is the largest um, library association in uh, the United States. It's actually an association of libraries and not necessarily librarians. Um, they set a lot of guidelines for uh, running libraries in different settings. Um, and it's quite large. I can't remember how many people are members, but when the American Library Association meets at its annual meeting, that can be up to 20,000 people um, at the conference. So these are some of the issues in intellectual freedom. So banned books is one thing, but I look at a lot of different things in my work. So a lot of people talk about things under the legal bubble. I'm sorry, this is so small. Uh, so things like First Amendment law, um, also things like the European Union hate speech laws. Um, I do work in philosophical issues. So really thinking about the ethics of information. So that's, um, Things like um, how do we make decisions about what should be um, accessible and what shouldn't? Um, issues of justice, morality. One that always comes up a lot with libraries is libraries should be should libraries new, are, be neutral? Are libraries neutral? Um, issues of privacy. Privacy is incredibly important for intellectual freedom. In order to be able to um, explore different issues, you 
really need to know that people are not looking over your shoulder to do that. So that's where I do research on internet filtering. Uh, this is also important in public libraries. So things like how do you manage the records, your circulations records um, in a library? There are guidelines that the American Library Association and the Public Library Association, which is a division of ALA, uh, put out to um, for that for handling various types of records. Um, I'm going to go up to policy development. So a lot of policies are based on guidelines um, from the American Library Association. These uh, guidelines are not binding, but they are what the profession as a whole has said. These are our professional commitments. So these include the code of ethics for professional librarians and other library workers. Um, also the Library Bill of Rights. So you can look these up. You can see what you have the right to in a library. Um, also things like challenge policy. So I can talk a little bit about that. That relates directly to banned books. Um, also things like access. That's a major aspect of um, intellectual freedom and censorship. So how do you select books in a library? How do you classify those books? So do they go in the J section or the YA section? Those are all questions about access. Um, actually studying challenges, that's what I do. And I always mention bibliography because those are the lists of books. So I'm sure you've seen the lists and lists and more lists of books that have been put out um, that uh, people are like, these are the books that are being challenged right now. Formally, that's called, formally, that's called um, bibliography. So um, documenting the lists. I'm actually the editor of a um, journal called the General Journal of Intellectual Freedom and Privacy. And we have a huge news section that goes through every single challenge case that's happening now. And eventually those will be pulled out and put into a list so that we know we have a firm idea of what has been challenged over these past two years. So one thing I'm going to talk about a little bit is what I call censorship practices. So what do I mean by that? Um, I try not to think about censorship as one thing. So you probably have heard something like, oh, well, those books aren't really banned, right? Or that's not really censorship. Ship. I try not to get into that because I think about censorship as a constellation of practices. What do I mean by that? So censorship is a way of changing access or imposing your idea of who should have access to something. And there are four R's for censorship. So that's redaction, restriction, relocation, and removal. So I'll show you some redaction, but basically redaction is when someone marks through something. Restriction is when you say, okay, I know that this book is for this particular audience, but in order for that audience to have access to the book, they need to go through some process. So sometimes the process is, okay, we're gonna put that book behind the shelf, behind the desk. So you have to ask the librarian to see it. Or you might say, in order to see that book, you have to have a permission slip. So then in order, you know, your parents have to say, yes, you can see that book. These are restrictions. Um, the book is still somewhat accessible, but not directly. So it's indirectly accessible. Uh, relocation is often what people talk about. That's when a book is moved from its intended audience to a different audience. So where we usually see this, especially in public libraries, is that a book that is intended to provide sexual education to a kid. So something like Roby Harris's It's Perfectly Normal, which is written for kids ages five to nine so that they know more about their bodies. Um, she, that book is sometimes put in a parent section or it's moved to a YA section, even though it's intended and the language that it's used, that's used is really for younger kids. So that is a relocation. So you would say that in 
public library land, that'd be something like moving something from J, that's juvenile, to YA, which is young adult, or to the parent section so that a kid couldn't find the book on their own. There's a lot of discussion in censorship practices about people stumbling upon information. Um, and so that's one of the ways that that happens. Removal is what most people think about with censorship. That's when something is actually taken out of a collection. Now, for what we're going through right now, it's really important to think about what is the request? So if we're talking about like a school, is the request to remove the book from the curriculum, from the school library, from the summer reading list? These are actually very different requests. Um, is it to remove a book permanently from the school, um, from the public library shelves? That's a different request. So I try to pay a lot of attention to what the actual request is for, for removal. So again, those practices are redaction, restriction, relocation, removal. I call those active practices because you have to engage in them. Um, passive practices are things like self-censorship. So my main worry now is that people, um, authors, creators may be a little less willing to write about certain topics because they are worried about backlash. So that would be self-censorship if you decide to do that. Also, another passive practice is bias. So that's saying, I'm not going to purchase that because I disagree with it. That's a different type of censorship. So what I study is something I call the discourse of censorship. Um, what I'm really saying there is I look at how do people make their arguments? What is the language that they use? I look at state, what I call um, three different things. So power, identity, and the nature of knowledge. So by power, I just mean like, how do people impose their own power over others? By identity, I say mean things like, well, I'm a taxpayer, so I get to say what's in the library, or I'm a parent, so I get to say what's in the school. Those are using your identity um, to impose certain ideas on your own values on, this, on the institution. And then I also look at the nature of knowledge. So I'm really interested in what does it mean to read? So reading is something that's incredibly important um, to be literate is something that we insist on in our society, but thinking more about like, how does reading change us as people? What do we understand reading to be? What does it mean when I pick up a book and start reading it? Um, so I'm just interested in that. I'm interested in how people think about libraries because I think libraries are awesome, but uh, you know, what do people understand the library to be? Libraries are very magical. So like very few people know how new books appear on the library shelf, right? You walk into the library, you go to the new bookshelf, the book you wanted is there or a book you hadn't even heard about and you take it off the shelf and you don't even have to exchange money and you get to take it home. Like that's a really interesting process and very few people have any idea of how the book appears on the shelf in the first place. Um, so this picture is from when Mouse was removed um, from Tennessee. So it's uh, the school board meeting right after that. You can see there are lots of people, there are actually people going out the door. Um, book hearings are always very exciting. Uh, people get very passionate. And I'll show you some of that um, as I go through uh, this talk. So what I really think about are people trying to control knowledge. This is still one of my favorite pictures. This is Mike Holtznick talking about the absolutely true diver part-time Indian by Sherman and Alexi. Um, he is a lawyer. He has this exhibit behind him. Uh, he blew up the pictures he does not like in this book to talk about them. This was a huge case in Stockton, Missouri. Um, when I wrote away for um, doing a FOIA request for the uh, documents on this, I actually received um, about 500 pages worth of documents. Um, but it was an amazing case. But this is really what I think about. Because in many ways, trying to ban a book is a futile act, right? Uh, books are available all sorts of places. Um, 
you do restrict access, but what are you trying to accomplish when you say, I don't want people to read this book? And I'm focusing on books, but actually we can focus on other types of materials, um, you know, movies, other things, although those don't come up nearly as much as books do. And I think this is because of the importance of reading. So this is a great picture, but I also like to show this picture because it's so similar to the previous one. So this is Ted Cruz talking about anti-racist baby at uh, Justice uh, Brown Jackson's hearing. And you can see it's the same thing. Uh, he blew up the pictures that he does not like to get her to talk about this children's board book. It's a great book if you haven't read it. Um, and his assistant here is changing the pages so we can talk about whatever he's upset about. So very quickly, this is some of the theory that I use. Basically, um, what I talk about in my work is that people are have different strategies that they bring to reading. So what do I mean by that? Um, basically, the tech like whatever you see on the page doesn't have any meaning encoded in it. So like the text doesn't tell you what it is. What you do is you bring your own baggage to that text and you say, I think this is what this means. So people who share certain baggage when they bring it to the text are um, are part of what I call, uh, actually what Stanley Fish calls, an interpretive community. So we often think that we read alone, but actually reading is very social. So I have here one of the banned books clubs that started, I think this is in Yorktown, uh, yeah, this is, sorry, this is in Kutztown, um, Pennsylvania, and uh, these people have started reading banned books because reading is actually much more social than we think about. It's not actually as much of a solitary activity as it's often portrayed. This is from Elizabeth Long from this book um, called The Ethnography of Reading. So what I do in my work is I go through time. And basically what I try to look at is how have we understood reading over time? So I look at something I call reading practices. This is from the um, field of book history and print culture studies. So this is basically a relatively new field um, where people really think about books as an object. Like what does it mean that we have these things called books and how did they come about? how have they changed over time and print culture is really thinking about like and how do we think about that in our society so not to be too technical but like what are some of the things i look at are like how did people used to read so for example we used to read out loud the reason i have a picture of a monk here is that what used to happen is that in the monastery someone would read from the bible out loud to the monks. We didn't used to read silently. This was something that just started in the Middle Ages, which is actually quite recently, um, to read silently. Before that, people read out loud to each other. And the importance of reading out loud is that somebody can interrupt you, right? They can say, I see that you just read this text. Let me tell you how you should think about that. And so there's this in this person who can like intervene in thinking about a text, but that's actually impossible when you read silently. People don't know where you are on the page. This is even more true with um, e-readers. People don't even know what you're reading. So the way I like to talk about this is that when we had when e-readers came about um, there was a huge increase in the number of romance books that people read why because no one knew you were reading a romance book they didn't see your co the cover so there was a huge spike in romance reading um, because it was silent and it was also very private um, so that's one of the things i talk about i talk about uh, some of the changes that came about in the uh, uh, Reformation. 
so what happened in the Reformation is that this doctrine came about called, it's called sola scriptura. It just means like by scripture alone. And basically what the reformers said was you can save your soul through reading, right? I said, I emphasize reading a lot in my work. So this is the one of the things I emphasize, which is that the idea that a text can actually change who you are as a person and save your soul. Um, also, there is the priesthood of um, believers, so there's no one between you and that text. Some of this gets very technical, but really it's just a way of thinking about how do we understand reading? Um, the reformers were actually quite concerned about their doctrines after a while, and what they started doing was writing interpretations around, so if you had a Bible from uh, the 16th century, for example, you'd see like little notations that say how you are supposed to actually interpret the text that you're reading because they were very concerned that people would not interpret them correctly. Um, in the more modern era, what I talk about are, is an idea of like interpreting with common sense. So the idea that if I give you a, a piece, a page from a book, you will see that this is how this is interpreted. There's no other way to do this. Um, this is, I use some fancy terms, monosemic, polysemic. The main thing to know is that the meaning is very obvious from the text. Texts say what they mean and mean what they say. Also, I talk a little bit about things like having undisciplined imagination, the idea that if you read about someone doing drugs, you're gonna do drugs. That's an issue that people talk about a lot. Um, so this is really the theory that I use to discuss why people ban books. So this is just from last year. Um, these are the numbers that ALA put out. You can see down there at the bottom, the reasons given for a challenge and critical race theory is one of the big ones. You can also see who initiates challenges, where they take place. So 37% in a public library. You can actually find all this information. If you just Google um, ALA ban books week, um, you can find all of the information they put out. They've actually, there were so many challenges last year that they actually put out a half year report this year which they've never done before, but we are on um, track to have even more challenges in 2022 than we had in 2021. I should also tell you that challenges are massively underreported. So yes, we're hearing about tons of them in the, uh, in the, um, in the news, but we actually suspect that challenges are underreported by about 90%. So there is a big fear that people are actually just removing things from their shelves, that they are just not buying things, but those don't get reported, so we don't know about them. I do wanna bring up a little bit about why this becomes such a difficult issue. So um, one of the things I discuss quite a bit is issues of um, hate speech and how do we provide access to lots of different types of information. Um, so one of the things I have my students read is uh, this book called, uh, hold on, something happened to my thing. Uh, that's fine. Um, this book called Words That Wound, which is actually by the people who originally started. Um, they were actually students of Derrick Bell. So as we talk more about critical race theory, um, they used critical race theory in 1993 <laughs> to discuss issues of harm. So this is by Matsuda, Lawrence Delgado, and especially Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, who is the person who came up with the theory of intersectionality. So I don't agree with everything in this book, but it is a very important idea about um, thinking about First Amendment law and uh, free speech. So they say critical race theory uses the experience of subordination, to offer knowledge of race and the law. Um, and that victims' experiences remind us of the hate um, 
what racist hate messages do. So they are you doing actual critical race theory in this book, um, and I highly recommend it. Um, if you're interested in seeing a different point of view to think about intellectual freedom and censorship. So talking a little bit more about critical race theory, this is from um, No Left Turn. You can go to this website and see how they are discussing critical race theory. So this is part of the work that I am do. I'm interested in, I call the discourse of censorship, how people use language. So for example, they talk about racial justice. Uh, racial justice is a systemic fair treatment of all of people of all races, resulting in equitable opportunities and outcomes for all. However, if you keep reading, under CRT, racial justice can take the form of lower standards for certain members of certain groups in order to achieve equity. This harms the students and essentially the bigotry of low expectations, which was, of course, a term that was used quite a bit through the 90s and early 2000s. Um, but also, um, sometimes people argue with me like, well, they're not really talking about critical race theory. And I'm sort of like, well, that doesn't really matter. What matters is that we can engage people from where they are when they are talking about issues of racial injustice. So this is a good example of trying to understand where people are coming from. Um, so according to CRT, whites are inherently racist, therefore require instruction on how to change their attitudes and behavior. Of course, that's not really what CRT is about at all. CRT is actually about how systemic racism um, has implications for different uh, racial groups when it comes to law and justice. Um, Actually, it's not even about uh, any when people talk about systemic racism, it's not actually about people being inherently racist or not. It's that the system is inherently racist because it is built on a foundation of slavery. But if you're arguing with people about that, that doesn't really matter. OK, so this is a letter from Moms for Liberty. Uh, in Tennessee, talking about the wit and wisdom, wit and wisdom curriculum. And it really takes into account these uh, discussions about uh, critical race theory. So, what they say in this letter, and you can Google this letter um, and to take a look at it. Uh, for nine weeks, wit and wisdom focuses repeatedly on daily and and daily on very dark divisive slivers of American history. And they go on, uh, the narrow slanted obsession on historical mistakes reveals a high heavily biased agenda, one that makes children hate their own country, each other or themselves. This is typical uh, discussion about like, what I'm interested in is the idea of, of using the idea of harm that we saw from Matsuda and the others who wrote, wrote words that wound to talk about harms to the majority population, which is a very interesting twist that has happened with this. Um, so they say that this is a manipulative politic pedagogy that all work together to amplify so feelings of resentment, shame of one's skin, color, or fear. Um, they go on to be very upset about the term injustice. They write down every time injustice shows up in the wit and wisdom curriculum. So this is an interesting use of language, the idea that injustice is problematic, but it shows that language is not shared across people. So if I say injustice, that sounds like something we should work on, but for people who are bringing these challenges right now, that is not what they say. So this is what they say at the end. Um, attachment two features parent testimony regarding her second grade biracial son, who is now ashamed of his half white, his white half, his white father, and his country. Um, attachment three gives parent testimony of a second grade black student who now sees himself, they meant now, not no, no, sees himself as oppressed because of his skin color. It does not have to be a textbook labeled critical race theory for its harmful tenets to be present in the curriculum. The evidence is present in the outcome. So 
one of their most interesting things, and let me find my notes, sorry, on this, is that they are also quite upset about a book by Ruby Bridges. So this is Ruby Bridges Goes to School, My Story by Ruby Bridges. So on pages two and three, they're upset about pictures of a neighborhood sign that says, we want white tenants in our white community and a smiling boy that says, we won't go to school with Negroes. On page 14 and 15, shows a white group of white people holding up a sign that read, we want segregation, we don't want to integrate. But most interesting to me is that they are upset about this particular painting by Norman Rockwell, one of our most avant-garde uh, illustrators. <laughs> the problem we all live with. So uh, th this is a picture of Ruby Bridges going to school with the um, US Marshals. They are upset about this because it depicts her walking to school with the N word in the background. So I, I just have to say, outside of like my <laughs> work here, this is one of the most surprising things I've ever seen. Um, Norman Rockwell is did the Saturday Evening Post. He was really one of the foremost illustrators of our world. He was depicting something that he saw. There are pictures of Ruby Bridges next to this picture. Um, and it's a, it's just so strange to me to be upset about this because this is a depiction of something true. They're upset about photographs and they're, and they're upset about Norman Rockwell. I, it's, it's very difficult for me to um, get into this headspace where this could be upsetting, right? Like um, Ruby Bridges is telling her story. This is this actually happened to her. Um, it is important that people know about her story. How else are you going to tell the story? Um, People who didn't want her to integrate into the class. In fact, when she showed up in school, there was no one else in the class with her. Um, so thinking that through, it, it, the idea that we should not tell painful stories um, is really something that I've been grappling with a lot um, over these past few months. So this is from About the Hate You Give um, by Angie Thomas. This is actually from, I think, 2016. Um, but these people were very upset about it. You can actually see that there's a censorship practice. They redacted their telephone and address. Um, but the Downs say uh, that our children are faced daily with bad language, drugs, sex in schools. It's an epidemic. We don't need to push this by promoting books that continue this theme. They say the book should only be for people who are 17 years of age because the movie will be rated R. But most importantly, they say we see no literary value to this book. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with The Hate You Give, Angie Thomas's book is really about um, talking about the movement for Black lives from the point of view of a teenager. Um, it's impossible to talk about teenagers' lives, Black Lives Matter, without talking about things like bad language, drugs, and sex. Um, also, you notice they don't say anything about police violence here. Um, they are actually quite upset that the police are shown in a poor light, but the book is about a, an unarmed black man who is shot by the police and um, her protagonist's response to that. Um, so this is, these are really the kinds of um, even though I did this in 2016, I wrote a book, a, sorry, an article about uh, challenges to diverse first books. It's really exploded um, over the past two years. And I am happy to answer any questions if anything is unclear as I go through this. So this is just how I do my work. I basically read through all the things that people say, and then I code them. Um, so I say, oh, this is really someone talking about a permission form. I'm sorry, you can't see all that are under this, but this is about the bluest eye. So people say things about permission forms. This is actually one of the most important 
uh, arguments, the one underneath here about diverse books, which is the idea that any book can be substituted for another book. So rather than read the bluest eye, you can read something else that will give a comparable learning experiences. This is really um, Chimamanda Adichie's argument about the one story, the idea that um, people who are not white have one story that can be told. Um, and The Bluest Eye is a very important work. There aren't many comparable works because it is a work about generational trauma. Um, it's very difficult to have something that is not um, what I would call a difficult read. Um, so these are just some of the themes that I look at. So I look at how people, one of the most interesting things that people talk about is how the presence of these books will lead to the decline and depravity in society. Um, the idea that uh, there's often a discussion of spiritual warfare, like we will lose our children forever if they read this book. Um, there's a lot of discussion about parenting, that parents fall down on the job, and that public libraries and public schools need to help parents do things. Um, parent, actually. So let me actually talk a little bit more about that argument. So what the argument is, because people often are unclear about this, they say, I do a good job choosing what my children will read. But because there are parents who are too busy, who don't care enough, um, they don't do a good job choosing what their children should read. And therefore, the school or library should make sure that students shouldn't be able to read those books because there are parents, there are parents who don't care enough to make sure that the, their children aren't exposed to certain ideas. So it's a rather complicated argument, but you can see that it's like a shift um, because it's sometimes unclear of how that shift happens, but it's really an argument about good parenting. Um, I talk a lot and I've already talked a lot about reading, but I love this picture. These are altered books. You can find these on Etsy. Um, because I think this is how people think about books, right? That like pictures jump off the page. Um, and this is how we imagine that reading happens. Um, so some of the things I talk about are, um, you know, the idea that words mean what they say, say what they mean, that people will do what they read in a book. So like there's like this immediately idea that, a book will lead you to have bad moral character, either in the short or long term. So, let me just check the time. Okay, so I'm almost done. Um, <clears throat> so these are a lot of the books that are being challenged for right now. Uh, we put these under the heading of diverse books um, you might be interested in the We Need Diverse Books campaign. Uh, these are basically books that are about BIPOC people, people with mental illnesses, LGBTQIA people. Um, and those are the books that we really see are being challenged right now. Some of these are brand new books. Some of these books have been on this list forever. I always point out I Am Jazz. Uh, I Am Jazz, Jazz is now, I think in her 20s. This book has been on the list for a long time. Also, you see later, greater. Those books um, just make a lot of parents upset because they're done in uh, basically uh, text speak. Um, and then drama over here, how to be anti-racist. You can see what kind of um, books we have. So people often ask me, what can you do? Uh, read a banned book. So just pick a book. There's 850 of them on the uh, representative out of Texas, Krause. If you just look up the Krause list, you'll find something I'm sure that you are interested in reading. reading. This is an update uh, from Jane Mount. Uh, she has two different banned books lists. I'm sure you can find something in here. The 1619 Project is on there. Uh, that might be of interest to you. So really read a banned book 
support the uh, um, authors who write these books. Um, there are many different national campaigns. So I'm going to start on the right here. Uh, the Unite Against Book Bans, anybody can join it. Um, you can uh, receive updates on things that might be happening in your community to fight against book bans. I'm actually the chair of the board of the National Coalition Against Censorship. We do a lot of work both on visual art censorship and also work with youth. And I just remember I have a bunch of of videos I need to watch uh, from the uh, Youth uh, Freedom of Expression Project. Um, and we are part of the coalition uh, for the United Against Bans Book Bans. If you are a writer, please consider joining Pan America. That is the writer's voice in it when it comes to uh, book banning. And the Freedom to Read Foundation, I'm a former president, um, is the legal arm of the American Library Association. So if something comes up that affects libraries, uh, it is the Freedom to Read Foundation that takes that on in the courts. This is my favorite. Uh, <clears throat> poster of all time from Banned Books Week, uh, because it really gets to my work, which is the idea that words have power. This is why people ban books. They actually, so I think what gets confusing about people is that I hear a lot about like, well, they don't read books, they don't understand. But actually, if you were going to the trouble to ban a book, it actually means that you think books are extremely powerful, that they have um, extreme resonance with people, that they will actually change you as a person. Otherwise, why would you bother? What is the point um, if you didn't feel that way about books? Um, and I just feel like this poster gets that across so clearly. So. That's all I have today. I'm um, happy to answer any questions you might have. These are my books. Um, the Foundations of Intellectual Freedom comes out in the fall. Um, book banning in 21st century America is now out in paperback and is available most places. Um, I edited that book on trigger warnings. I can also talk about trigger warnings. Um, and then I have this book on Foundations of Information and Ethics that I co-edited um, that really talks about how do we think, how do we make ethical decisions in um, a tech and knowledge society? So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. If, if you have a question, uh, you can use your reactions tab to raise your hand or ask in the chat field and we will uh, somehow uh, get your question asked. also use your mic yeah i'd have to unmute them so. oh okay so there is a question can you tell us more about your work on trigger warnings oh sure <laughs> so uh my editor at Rowan and littlefield asked if i would write something on trigger warnings i, I said no absolutely not i will edit that book for you um so i uh, put that together. That book is really interesting. So it's called Trigger Warnings, History, Theory, Context. Um, the interesting thing about trigger warnings is that they are very embedded in interpretive communities. So I would go around and talk to about people about trigger warnings and some people would say, what's a trigger warning? Um, and then other people would say, should I use a trigger warning or a content warning? So that helped me realize that like, this is really about um, how communicate communities communicate with each other. Um, they are intended to keep harm away, but what I've also found is that they are actually part of, um, understanding more things about intersectionality. So what is most likely to get trigger warnings, not necessarily the killings or brutalization of black people, but often other things get trigger warnings. Um, also, people provided histories to me for me to think about trigger warnings 
really starting with shell shock soldiers coming from World War One, which, you know, these are things I just would not have put in. Uh, PTSD was actually first recognized by the Romans <laughs> when their soldiers would come back and the Roman legions. Um, I also had several community college English professors. They talked about trigger warnings very differently. So one word we use is hail. So it's kind of a technical term, but who is the person that you think a trigger warning is for? Generally, you think it's for a young, white, cis woman, usually in college, right? Like that's who trigger warnings are for. Um, and so that's what we say is that that is who's hailed by, and that's H-A-I-L-E-D, by a trigger warning. But the people who teach at community colleges would talk about veterans who had come back from Iraq and Afghanistan, who would be in their English classes, and they would read something. And sometimes they would say, well, I tried, they would read this, and then they would never show up again. Um, sometimes they would walk out of the class because of the trauma that they had had um, from their time fighting wars. And of course, right? Trigger warnings are about all sorts of people with PST, PTSD, but we actually don't hail veterans um, when we talk about things like trigger warnings. Um, trigger warnings are a very blunt instrument. Uh, they are very appropriate in some places and they can be very odd in other places. And also you really have to think about your goal. What are you trying to do? If you are an English teacher, it might be that your students need to read the bluest eye, which might cause trauma for them. So how are you going to make sure that that is as good an experience as, as it can be? It might be very upsetting. There's no way around that. That book is very upsetting. Um, but it's an important part of thinking about, as I mentioned, generational trauma. So just giving a trigger warning doesn't actually provide doesn't say much about what comes next after the trigger warning. Thank you. Any other questions, concerns, comments? I think maybe a question I had just in your um, overview is, what do you think is prompting the uh, uptick we see in the challenges of the last year or so. Yeah, so someone asked for the crowds to list. So hopefully this will go through. Yeah, put if it in not, the I can send it, I can send it another time. But if you just Google crowds a list, it's the first thing that comes, well, uh, who knows? It's the first thing that comes up for me, but maybe not for you. So let me just copy it this way. I put the crowds list under the book riot, Texas book. Okay. Book. It's in the chat. <clears throat> yeah, you can check it there. Yeah. So what is really leading to all of these challenges right now is our changes in society. So <laughs> I, I know that seems very broad, but we are going through a huge shift. Um, Demographers anticipate that in 18 years, um, we will be a majority minority country. So it's actually, if you think about it that way, it's actually not surprising that this is happening now uh, because this is 20 years before that happens. Um, so we are seeing that shift. That shift has already happened in the other under 18s, which is actually why this shows up so much in schools because how do you make sure that your classroom is full of kids who will be dealing with kids who are not majority white um, are able to uh, engage in the society that they will have in 50 years. Um, we have our politics is extremely reactionary. So uh, you can actually just see Obama was elected, then Trump was elected. We are going through these 
really difficult times. So why challenges? So the reason why people challenge books is that it's actually extremely localized government. So you can't really make much of a difference in Congress, right? Like you can vote, you can call them, but you can make a huge difference at your public library, at your public school. So um, there's also, I think the pandemic is really important. The pandemic brought school home. Uh, my dad likes to talk about how uh, when I finally went to public school in first grade, uh, he's like, yeah, I sent you off and you were gone. I didn't know what happened there, right? Like you were gone and then you came back. But the pandemic meant that school was at the dining room table. And I think a lot of parents hadn't realized how much social emotional learning was happening, how much uh, examples had changed, new math, what kids were reading. Like there were, there are a lot of changes um, in pedagogy uh, now. And I think that was very surprising for people, but mostly it's extremely local political activism. Um, you can go to your public library board, you know, like anybody can go, it's an open meeting. You can say whatever you want. Like it's, it's also very easy to get involved, which is what I encourage people to do to run for your school board. Um, that sort of thing. Um, so it's just really important to, um, think about it that way. So it's, it's really localized uh, political activism because you can actually make a difference at that level.